everyone and welcome to Art for Art's Sake. This is a new program from the St. Lawrence County Arts Council, though I feel odd saying it's new because we are on episode 29 today. Um, this program is a way for us to keep our community connected to our local artists or in our case today, formerly local artists. Um, we're really excited to be able to share the people we have, the amazing talents that are in the North Country or come out of the North Country. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you are an artist um, and you would like to share your talents with us in whatever way you'd like, reach out to me directly. You can email me at director at slcartscouncil.org and um, we'll set up a date for you. We're scheduling out a couple weeks in advance. So you'll have some time to prep your presentation, whatever that is. Um, we also want to thank all of our sponsors, past and present, for um, helping to support this organization and helping to support this program. If you are interested in supporting your local arts, which I hope everyone would be, but if you if you can, go in and throw in a couple dollars. Go to slcartscouncil.org slash give to make a donation today. Um, so Julian is a friend of mine. If you've seen my house before, which most of you have at this point, you've seen Julian's huge piece of artwork that's behind me. Um, I'm actually hiding it with my little screen thing, back virtual background, but um, I absolutely love Julian's work. So I'm really excited to introduce you. Here we go to Julian Davis. Julian, how's it going? Oh, good. How are you? <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much for being here and take it away. Um, okay, well, welcome to my studio. Um, thanks for having me, I guess. I'll like start by explaining a little bit about my Potsdam connection. I used to live in Potsdam for um, more than 10 years and I went to school there uh, and studied painting at SUNY Potsdam and finished um, my mining degree in 2009. And then after that, uh, I was, um, helping run the Creative Spirit Art Center um, that um, while Otto was still alive, uh, yeah, I had a studio there and we would throw big um, exhibitions in his space. And so I was there for three years with my studio in Otto's space at the Creative Spirit. And then, um, yeah, 2013, I left Potsdam um, and I well, I, I went all kind of all over um, in in the years between then and now, um, and mostly I was living in India for five years, um, but I also traveled to um, basically everywhere else you could try and travel to, and did a lot of projects with my work, and did artist in residence programs in like the Amazon and the Sahara Desert, and in Istanbul, and did a lot of exhibiting my work and lugging um, suitcases full of paintings around the world and wood and glue and weird stuff um, all over. Um, and I eventually created my own artists in residence program that I um, hosted artists at in North India for, um, I guess the program lasted about a year or so or in 2018 and 2019. And so I basically rented this big um, building in the jungle and invited a bunch of artists to come live with me there for periods of time. Um, and it ended up being like 50% American artists and 50% Indian artists. And so we would just like live and work together for six weeks at a time and do exhibitions. Um, and about a year ago, I switched gears pretty strongly and moved back to the United States. So, so like, yeah, last May actually. So um, it's been about one year of me living in the US, which is, you know, it's, I, I was out for about seven years where I was not living in the US and just coming back for little bits of time. Um, so you're now catching me after a year of being sort of shifted into um, like a studio space that's not like, you know, a little guest house bedroom in another country. Um, and um, so I have this big space, which I share with my um, friend and uh, 
collaborative partner, uh, Miles Tolan, and uh, I'm actually happy to introduce your, his work um, at, a, at a minute because like we're both in the same room. So I'll do a little tour of the room and you'll get to see um, his work as well. But um, we uh, have this space uh, in a um, art studio community uh, in Northern California. Um, so it's a small old gold mining town called Nevada City. Um, it's in the Sierra Nevada foothills. So like three hours from San Francisco and like an hour from um, like Lake Tahoe. And uh, we're actually in a nail factory, which used to be used to make nails in the 50s. Um, so it's called the nail factory and there's 30 studios here and um, 10 of us live at the other side of the property. So it's a big compound in the woods. You know, it's about 15 minutes outside of town. And um, there's, yeah, there's a bunch of artists here doing a variety of weird and eccentric stuff at a, you know, varying degree of professionality. And there's some really cool stuff happening here um, and some really great projects. So I, yeah, I'm pretty happy to kind of be in this situation as opposed to um, some of the other situations I've enjoyed being in. But um, I think right now the sort of big dedicated studio space and um, staying put in a quieter, simpler lifestyle in the, in the woods is definitely um, suitable for not only me at this time, but also for my um, creative process and practice. So um, I guess I could kind of give an artwork tour or talk about some of what I do and why, but I'm also happy to answer some questions if anybody has any questions or Maggie, if you want to ask me a question. Sure, I'll jump in when I have questions and any, if anybody watching on Facebook wants to throw in a comment to the, just just put a comment in the, in the event here, or not event, but <laughs> in the live stream and I'll ask them too. But why don't you give us a studio tour? I'd love to see that. Okay, well, I can do that. So um, I'll see how I can manage with the computer, but you can kind of see behind me that this is my side of the studio. So it's a, it's a rather big space. Um, and so right here, you've got some of my older pieces and some of my newer pieces and some stuff that I'm working on. Um, so I, I tend to work on like five things at once. Um, and so you can see I've got like a number of in progress pieces in, in the corner here. And rather than have like a real good strategy and working to completion on one thing and then moving on to the next, I just kind of switch back and forth and um, go by sort of the whims of what's happening there. Um, and then I'll uh, scoot over here. Uh, Miles, I'm going to put you on the spot. And so this is my buddy Miles and we share the space. And yeah. Miles and I know each other from India, and that's how we ended up in the space um, together. And Miles is a super talented young man, and I'll um, take you into the hallway gallery and um, share some of both of our work. Yeah, and then if Miles feels like saying anything, he's got a minute to think about what he wants to say. Um, so we have this like uh, entrance way gallery to the space so um if you were to walk in you would see my stuff on the right and you'd see miles's work on the left including um this is actually a collaboration that the two of us did um we did a collaborative exhibition at a gallery here in october that was titled immerse so this is the title piece from that and it's the acrylic on birch um, so and for scale it's kind of big and um, so that's like a blend of the two of our styles which you can see so he does 
uh, all the, the surreal figurative work, um, which is mysterious and evocative. And um, obviously then I do the, what I call um, elaborate organic abstraction. So that references the way it looks as well as sort of the way um, it's made. So it's made very organically. Um, and it, you know, it's obviously referencing lots of forms that are natural and non-linear. So there's very little sharp, hard lines and it's really, um, I can try to keep <laughs> passing through, but it's really, it's, it's about um, suggestions of um, organic processes and suggestions of interconnectedness and the vocabulary of the natural world sort of reassigned in an abstract way. So when I say elaborate organic abstraction, I, I want it to be abstraction for the sake of abstraction, which means that it's not representing something specifically. I'm not trying to describe something um, that exists, that has a concept and uh, can have verbs and other words assigned to it, you know, so I'm trying to explore abstraction for the sake of abstraction, which is arriving at a space of experience, which is non-analytical and which does not give the mind little concepts to latch onto. And um, so the idea of elaborate organic abstraction references that, but beyond just that conceptual abstraction, which is lack of representation of a specific concept, it, it references also that sort of arrival to that state in an effortless way. So like organic can mean not only like the describing the forms, but like the sort of the way it's created and also the experience of interacting with it. So it, it, it happens in an organic way. It's an improvisational process, which um, involves a lot of layering and a lot of like re-responding um, with fresh eyes to the composition as it's evolving. So um, that sort of idea of it being effortless in terms of it's not, um, I'm not striving for a specific message or um, description of something, but just kind of letting uh, the imagery be coaxed out. So um, I guess I can keep walking through and <laughs> some of the um, stuff and I can show some of the stuff that I'm um, working on. What's your primary so, medium? Oh, what's my primary medium? I use um, a, uh, several mediums. I do a lot of oil on panel or um, wood and I do acrylic on panel or wood and paper. Also on paper, I use things like watercolor and gouache, but I, I really usually use um, acrylic on paper and the acrylic looks like watercolor. I can sort of, um, you know, I've got like a stack here of some stuff, but like this is like an acrylic painting on paper that looks like watercolor. So I do a lot of stuff on paper that is watered down, but the acrylic has some properties that are different from watercolor. So you can get like slightly more vibrant colors and you can also get some edges of forms that are a little bit more defined and you can also do some layering. So I, I prefer to use acrylic on paper. And then most of what you see behind me is oil on panel. Um, and I often do an acrylic underpainting or a wash like this one is barely started. So this one, I've just done the underpainting, which is just an acrylic wash and it just gives color and texture and sort of a bit of composition. And then I'm going to start going in with the oil and layers and do a lot of um, excruciating passes of detail and that kind of layering, it creates the sort of depth and movement that I like to arrive at. So the, um, this one is like, hasn't had that done to it. And then you can see the two up top, which the glare is making it hard to see the colors and stuff. But um, I can I can sort of get up in there. Let's see if um, you can see that a little better. But 
Um, with the glare, it's a, it's a subtle one. It's got a lot of light, sort of naturally pastel sort of colors, but that's a oil on panel piece. So I'm not sure how well you can see that. But um, yeah, because okay, because sometimes they, you can't really see them in, unless it's in person. Like it's hard to photo, photograph or video on some of them. But um, here's another one that I'm working on now, which is oil on panel, and it's pretty close to done. I just need a couple more layers, and you can see I'm also framing it. So I also build all the frames myself. So this is done with a poplar, and it'll be painted black and it's got this sort of recessed little shadow box thing going on. So um, that's another big project in here is making all the frames and um, the substrates to paint on. Because I don't, I don't like to use canvas. I'm, I'm thoroughly allergic to canvas and canvas <laughs> stays out of my life and out of my studio completely. Um, so I'm doing all on wood or panel. On, on these ones, so that involves a bit of construction. There was a question about glazes. Um, yeah. You, what, what, what question mark? Glazes, question mark. What? Yeah, all mark more glazes. It's all glazes. It's like, I don't use um, too much other techniques. So glazes with oil is you use a medium like this stuff, which is a, you know, a yummy petroleum distillate that's super, um, smells really good and doesn't damage like your brain cells at all if you breathe it no i'm just kidding it's um it's kind of gross stuff but if you put that on a brush and mix it with oil paint then it creates this transparent soupy goo which is perfect for what i do so i just layer that on again and again and again and i mean i really only i start out in with like an under like painting and then I do some what are called washes which is used with water and the acrylic on the underpainting and then the glazing is just I just basically layer up the glazes so that's kind of a slightly unusual technique usually a lot of people just glaze at the end and so that's kind of part of my specific approach is to use like kind of primarily glazes to um, build up a, a lot of layers so you can see through the, the glazes so it becomes textured and there, it adds a lot of depth and you get nuanced layering of color so you can create colors by layering colors rather than by mixing them and then that creates like a shimmery sort of effect so um, that's what I do yeah basically all glazes and then when I do acrylic and I want to make it look like glazes I do things like varnish in between layers and then I do semi um, transparent washes of acrylic which is watered down acrylic but because it's between those plastic um, varnish layers it gives um, a bit of depth in that way I can um, yeah so here this is a this one's like acrylic on wood but you can see I guess that it's varnished you can see the glare and so in between those layers of varnish are layers of paint so that gives it depth in that um, kind of mimics the effect of the glazes in a medium that doesn't really glaze well. Like acrylic, if you want to glaze and you want to use like the glazing mediums, they, they kind of really reinforce your brush strokes and it's not smooth and glass-like and sort of ethereal like the oil. So I want that transcendent sort of ethereal feel to it. I don't want it to be really obvious that it's like clumps of paint or how it was made. I want it to sort of um, not like be a little bit mysterious and hard to understand what's going on and also not be obvious how it was made and sort of in, give it that invitation to turn into an experience that's not rooted in like the material presence of the painting. It's not like a chunk of wood on the wall because it is a chunk of wood on the wall with paint colors put on it, right? But like the, I want that basic reality of what the object is to disappear as much as possible. So I don't want to draw attention to the materials. I want to draw, like hide that a bit and have it be sort of um, something that you can get lost in what it is and just sort of see it as experiences of form and relationship and rhythm and movement and depth. Yeah. Awesome. Um, 
question came to me earlier, elaborate organic abstractions. It feels like so much of your work has this, or, or your creative process or whatever we want to call it, has this uh, philosophical, perhaps spiritual, religious kind of like yeah. feeling to it, the way you talk about it at least. How has that changed over time throughout your, your, your artistic career here? Oh, well, that sort of initial impetus hasn't really changed much at all since I was in college at Potsdam. Um, I'd say that my vocabulary and understanding of that approach has evolved a lot. Um, and when I say vocabulary, I mean like visual vocabulary. I mean like sort of a visual makeup of um, how to express certain sort of states of perception. Um, so I'd say that there's definitely a, an embedded spiritual quality to art making for me, but I'm not trying to produce any sort of commentary on spirituality or religion. And I don't want to share so much of an opinion because I'd actually rather um, let it be left to a, a non-verbalized sort of um, transaction. And when I say transaction, I mean like when you're looking at a, a work of art, like that's in a, in a way it's a transaction because like your mind is processing this experience and then that results in something, right? Like there's some sort of response within your awareness to what you're looking at. So, so I like to think of it as a transaction and I, I like to think of it as a nonverbal transaction. So I'm trying to invite these nonverbal transactions, which stay nonverbal and allow the um, viewer's mind to um, refrain from jumping onto the, the analysis boat and try and figure out what's going on and create a narrative. Because I don't want a narrative. I feel like, you know, to me, I guess that's the biggest um, tie in I can sort of like articulate about spirituality is that for me reality experience without a narrative is what is like sacred or spiritual reality right so with the mind not creating a story about what you're experiencing so that's like to me the the practice of making the paintings inhabits that space and then it's an invitation to the person viewing to to live without the narrative for a bit because the, the narrative of the mind creating a story which has sort of um, qualitative applications applied to it just by the nature of language. So I, I want to have that invitation to, to not have a narrative whatsoever. And that, that's actually, in a way, that then also means I'm making a bit of a statement in terms of contemporary art because contemporary art is super narrative obsessed um, to the point that I find it obnoxious. And so, like, to intentionally offer that this is narrative-free, um, and I, I don't want there to be a narrative, and I, I want to invite you to resist the urge to create a narrative about everything you experience and to reside in that nonverbal space. So that's, like, to me, that's that sort of raw spiritual perception, if you want to call it spiritual. Um, I'm certainly not a religious person, so I certainly shy away from religion. And even though I've like done a lot of studies of religion and um, uh, embedded myself pretty deeply in religious environments in different places, um, I'm, that all just makes me less religious. And um, I also think that the more specifically you articulate a certain spiritual perspective with language, the further away you get from a you know, that sort of world. So I, I'm not interested in like um, offering sort of really concrete uh, summaries of what my spiritual beliefs are or like what, like some sort of religious or spiritual worldview. I'm, I'm not interested in sort of hashing that out. I'd rather invite just anybody to remove themselves from their own narrative and then have their own religious experience because that's where you have a religious experience from, I believe, is when there's not a narrative. And then you ruin that by creating a narrative around it and then creating a, um, a tradition, in my opinion. So, I love, I love that. And we have a comment in here, mysterious and interesting. Yeah, okay. yeah, <laughs> sounds well. like, he, uh, he also goes on, sounds like visual meditation. Yeah, it is. 
That's definitely what it is because I mean, meditation is sort of rather than the idea that it's to not think it's to observe your thoughts and not respond or react to them and not own them and not identify with your thoughts. So the process of meditation is the process of allowing the mind to present you whatever is like filling it up. And then you sort of acknowledge it, but it loses its power to, you know, remain in your field of awareness when you acknowledge it, but don't sort of identify with your thoughts and they disappear. So like in terms of it being a visual meditation, for me, it definitely is when I'm working because I'm, I'm not entertaining sort of concepts of what it looks like or where it's going or where it needs to end up. I want to stay in that space where I'm thinking about um, a really authentic in the moment response to the exact bit of the painting I'm working on. And so that's like the meditation that's like removing myself from the narrative as I'm creating. And that's sort of, like allowing the visual experience to sort of replace thoughts, I guess, you know, so rather than letting thoughts emerge and looking at them and letting them move, it's like I'm looking at this visual um, composition and my mind brings to my internal awareness an idea of an adjustment in terms of color or movement or line, like some bit changes in my when I'm looking at it, I notice what changes between what I'm actually looking at and what my mind is applying to it, and then I follow through with that app, like that input, like what what emerges as the natural response to how to change it. I I do that. I acknowledge it. I let it happen, and I don't get like attached or carried. So it is like there's that parallel with meditation that like the visual elements or the like cognitive elements are allowed to emerge and then they, they happen. And it's that sort of fluid, like it happens and it moves on and it doesn't, you don't like linger on it. And it's not like, you know, because if you then start thinking about it and then you bring in and invite space for that narrative to emerge where you're considering based off of like, you know, whatever feedback you've had or, how you're trying to land on an intellectual concept or whatever considerations. And then the mind is then out of that space where it's just allowing the natural creative um, sort of inputs to happen. And then it's like reconsidering and second guessing. And then it's, it's no longer in that like direct sort of flow of creative information. It's, it, it becomes considered and calculated. And then that's, that removes, that's removed from where I'm trying to go. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you. I feel like you've already sort of started talking about your creative process. I'm, um, and without creating a calculation or anything, how would you say that you you get started on a piece? What 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 brings you to to make that first stroke of whatever you're doing? Well, um, I mean, to for some context, I have like 20 things that could start at any time, meaning they're ready to start, like panels that are made and big stacks of paper. And so I like, I have like 20 options that would require no preparation to start on top of like the five things I'm already working on. So it sort of allows me to remove some of that calculation because then I like give myself options. And if something fits sort of the mood, because I could be a little bit more explorative feeling or I could be a little bit more um, ready to disembark on sort of like a grueling sort of marathon journey, right? So depending on what sort of creatively I'm feeling in that sense, I might start something big or I might start something small. And something small is something that I'm not putting a lot of sort of ambition to um, have it turn out really well developed or something so then I, I'll just experiment a little bit more and then and that's kind of like I don't know like writing poetry or something like it's just a little poem and it it has its place and it's not it's not going to replace a novel but it's like it has its place and so it's good to just like let that sort of creative information move freely through you and it also unclutters sort of like the airwaves you know and gets like some of those little tangents out of the way and then if I start something bigger I mean I really don't generally have much in mind other than maybe a color or two 
So I'll just start with the color palette. And a lot of times that happens right away, like immediately, um, like it's not pre-planned and I just have a bigger piece and I start with the colors and I mix some colors and build a color relationship. And that happens without too much like consideration, just like, you know, sort of intuitively and sort of just like responding to what I'm kind of in the mood for. And then I'll just do like the background wash bit happens really fast. So if I'm feeling kind of dynamic and feeling like really in the flow and then I'll start something big and then it usually comes takes shape pretty fast. And then once it's taken shape, the, the underpainting, then it, it, it's really just a matter of letting myself have the time. So I've been waiting to get into this one. This one I actually did the underpainting on like six months ago, but um, I know that once I start getting into it, I'm going to be pretty sort of preoccupied with that and leaving other things. So I've got some other smaller stuff I'm finishing up first that um, I've got people trying to buy. And then also um, I've been framing a lot of work that, you know, so like a lot of this is stuff that I've had for years for my travels and stuff. So just like getting everything framed and having it all set up in the space here so that we can post on open studios and stuff because actually I, I was like when this whole um COVID thing like happened I was had a lot of studio visits lined up in like those few weeks ahead so that all like that whole like sort of shutdown happened right as I was getting ready to be in gear to have like a a lot of open studio traffic so that'll have to wait but we'll definitely have sort of a big open studio party here once we are allowed to. That's awesome. Um, I know that some of your work is available here in Potsdam at the Maple Run Emporium still. It is, yeah, there, that's true. It's the last place um, that it's available in New York State. And there's like four little paintings left at Maple Run. And I, I've sold a bunch of pieces out of there in the past several years and all that stuff is stuff I left there in probably 2013. So it's, um, it's been hanging out and yeah, there's, I think four of these little watercolor paintings with these bamboo frames and there were 20 of them and those are the last four. So those are available there. Otherwise I, um, my work is available um, online through like the artsy account of the gallery that I work with here, but also, um, I mean, I have a little shop website that right now only prints are available on, and I've, I'm going to have originals available on there soon, which I could be happy to give the address out. But I also have like a catalog, which is like sort of the current format. So if anybody is interested in, in work, I can send out a catalog. Um, I could even just send you the catalog too, if you want. And then if anybody happens to contact yeah. you. Yeah. I had snagged your uh, big cartel website yeah. from your Instagram. So yeah, I have that Instagram. already. Yeah. And actually that's the other thing is honestly, mostly most of the art I sell is just people messaging me on Instagram and me sending them pictures of what they can have. And then <laughs> Perfect. It's really casual. And so, um, I guess my Instagram is julian.vetas.art and then I do have that link and there will be originals available through the link that's on there. But right now you can only buy prints through there. Um, and I have three different prints on there at different sizes. But for originals, yeah, you could con people could contact me directly or um, yeah, on Instagram and ask for a catalog or I'm happy to send you the catalog. Yeah. yeah, that'd be awesome. I'd love to see it for sure. I mean, even just personally, as I said, yeah. I really love your work. So I'd love to, I'd love to see that. Yeah, um, definitely. So have I told you about the Creative Spirit Art Gallery? No. The Arts Council is working on purchasing the Creative Spirit Art Gallery, okay. well, the whole space, uh -huh. and making it into an art center. Okay. It's cool. Awesome. That sounds really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're really excited about it. <laughs> so yeah, I had we'll, no idea. Maybe we'll set up a residency for you to come and 
spend a couple of weeks with us or whatever. <laughs> That'd be cool. I it's been I think almost two years since I've been back to Potsdam. So yeah. Well, we miss you here. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Is there anything else you wanted to mention before we, we cut ties here? No, I'm, I mean, I feel like we pretty much covered everything. I mean, I could like real quickly like show, like I've got, you know, just examples of like the prints I have. So these are like things that are like available for all the sort of budgets. Um, and yeah, like part of the continued um, uh, dedication to doing the art thing is that eventually some of your paintings get a little bit too expensive. So, um, <laughs> um, yeah, there's been some um, shifts in what's been um, normal as I've shifted into the um, more sort of serious studio setup, but um, yeah, I um, I don't know what else to say. I guess this, I'm, I'm happy to share and happy to connect with Potsdam. And um, if anybody wants to come visit and get like do the studio tour once like visiting and traveling are normal things to do again, then I'm happy to um, you know host people. And um, we've got like Ooh. guest rooms and um, we're we're in the we've got we're on 16 acres. We're in the forest. We've got like big cedar and redwood trees and stuff on the property and bears. And <laughs> so it's you know um, yeah because I know I, I imagine a lot of people I know are maybe hearing me talk. So come on out um, if you want. That sounds so awesome. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Julian. It's been really great to actually catch up with you and to, yeah. to see what you're up to here in the, back in the States. Um, uh, thank you so much to everybody who joined us today. This will be available um, after, we're, after we're done with the live. So check it out and share it, share, share. Thank you so much. This has been Art for Art's Sake. Okay, thanks, Maggie.